For over two millennia, philosophers have debated how we gain knowledge of the world. The Greek thinker Plato argued that there are universals of human cognition, such as concepts of beauty, justice, and the good, innate to us. While these ideas, or eidos, often referred to as platonic forms, are nuanced in each cultural setting, they can only be understood properly in the first place because of a prior overall conceptual framework. For instance, in China, India, Africa, Iran, and Greece, the inhabitants of these lands may define beauty or justice quite differently. Yet despite one's background, humans all seem to understand the overarching idea of beauty and justice. We begin to intuit these universals from the moment we enter this world, and they help us navigate our surrounding environment. Nonetheless, as a rationalist, Plato asserted that through reason and logic, it is the philosopher who can truly penetrate through all of these particulars and fully grasp the universal higher forms from which everything was modeled. This knowledge would be transformative, he added. Paul Churchland, in his 2012 text, Plato's Camera, focuses on the theme of Platonic universals. He too is interested in the idea of universal concepts and acknowledges their importance in his epistemological scheme. Like Plato, Churchland contends that this conceptual framework is necessary for our daily perceptual judgments. However, Plato and Churchland then begin to part company. Churchland places the source of these abstract categories in the natural world, specifically in the brain. When Plato offers his otherworldly explanation for why universal forms exist, that ingrained knowledge was evidence of a higher realm of existence, Churchland points to a neuronal interpretation. Interestingly, this approach contradicts John Locke's Tabla Rasa, the neurobiologist does take into account the environmental role in understanding epistemology, but he starts first with a basic antecedent framework which begins at birth and which allows us to interpret our sensory experience throughout our lives. How the brain does this, taking a picture of the world, so to speak, and developing a representation of it, is extensively detailed. Churchland refers to these representations as maps. There are not just a few, but multiple high-dimensional maps of external realities which supply us with the fabric to make sense of the world, these maps are, in a way, a modern version of Platonic forms and partly of Immanuel Kant's categories of understanding. And they do not arise, Churchland proposes, through language, but are in fact pre-symbolic and are due to the synaptic connections within the brain. There are three types of learning that Churchland delineates in his text. First-level learning forms the basic conceptual framework. He is not implying we are born with this framework, as Plato does, but that it starts to form from birth across the brain's synaptic connections, taking days, weeks, or even years to produce reliable mental maps of the objective world. He clarifies that this form of learning is independent of language and can thus apply to other animals as well. The pithy saying that neurons that fire together wire together captures the beginning of this type of learning. As the creature first interacts with the world, axonal activations occur, and this forms the rudiments of a background structure. Once the framework is in place, new sensory input can be interpreted and integrated, and this leads us to what he calls second-level learning. This form of learning takes place when the brain, human or animal, experiences new data in the environment, and one must make sense of it within the larger conceptual backdrop. The new stimuli can also alter the maps. One can think of this type of learning as the particulars one experiences every second of every day that is mixed with conceptual maps and made sense of. To highlight this, he uses the analogy of a rolling marble endlessly going up and down hills and valleys as it encounters the conceptual landscape of the brain. Finally, third-level learning specifically applies to the human being since it depends upon language. In this case, learning occurs through cultural and social systems as we index each other's models. This learning, transmitted through language, is extended beyond one's life and passed on to the next generation. It is essentially the exchanging and recording of mental maps. As mental trajectories, we can raise the ontological question of how well they represent reality. There is little doubt that maps will always be less than the territory they represent. Yet we can add the genetic twist that as long as these models procure our food and mates, and thereby extend our DNA lineages, these maps will be to our evolutionary advantage. With each generation of scientists, we add to our maps new insights and understandings that escaped our ancestors. And this is the beauty of the scientific endeavor. 
It is not a stagnant discipline, but a dynamic one which expands our mental maps to an increasingly broad and penetrating grip of the structure of the larger reality of which it is a part.